Hello, world singers. My name is Tyler. And my name is Brooke. This is Cosmere Cosmere Conversations. Conversations. We are back for another episode. It has been a hot minute. It's been a little while. it's been a bit. We needed to wait for White Sand to come out, and we also needed to decompress a little bit after our Oathbringer extravaganza, (laughs) which has taken up uh, episodes like 11 through 19, Mm -hmm. so... We definitely went way beyond what I was guessing of like two or three. I knew that it would be that long. And it was a good prediction on your part. So happy to have the opportunity to come back to the Cosmere after a little break. I feel like a little kid who has realized how great it is to like delay (laughs) <laughs> gratification for a little bit you know just put it off for like a little while because then the reward is so much sweeter <laughs> and i'm just like super stoked to be back in to our cosmere conversations yeah i'm excited to be back too and i feel like our break kind of allowed some more people to find us also so hello to all of you newer listeners thanks for joining the conversation we have a new book to talk about and a new story to talk about. This is one that we have referenced but have not taken the time to do a full breakdown and that is White Sand. White Sand, the graphic novel, is what you would Amazon search if you were interested in getting volume one or volume two of White Sand. I, though, would just call it a comic and this is where I want to start, Brooke, because I I am a big reader of comics, and I have read comics for, you know, most of my life back in the early days of... (laughs) I can remember reading comics before I feel like I could read anything else. Like, Encyclopedia Brown was maybe like elementary school, (laughs) but I remember reading comics before that. So, I go way back Wait, you were reading comics before elementary school? So, what, you were like three? Well, maybe not before elementary school, but definitely before, like, I can remember reading in, like, the library uh, in elementary school. sure. Like, I remember having comics as well. So, they've just always been around, and I have, you know, gone through all the phases of comics when you got the short little silly comics here and there. I feel like it's the natural extension of how we originally learned how to read. Great big pictures and, like, two words. True. Cat. Dog. Apple. And then I just went to Spider-Man and Batman and Superman and Bam, all... pow, kapow. Exactly. And then we have arrived here uh, with White Sand, and I'm guessing that you have very little experience with reading comics before. I do. I am not a huge comic reader. Have you ever read a comic of any type before White Sand. Yes. Okay. I am a big fan of the uh, Shakespeare manga series. Excellent, excellent. That is a fantastic adaptation of Shakespeare's works in a visual medium, which is how these stories are meant to be experienced anyway. So I think if you're going to read Shakespeare, it should be a comic book. So I that think that is-, is pretty cool. And also a good example of what a comic book can be for an adult because a lot of people may, like me may have read comics when they were young but then you know they grew up and they become sophisticated yeah i read and, real books now yeah exactly with only words no <laughs> pictures whatsoever but you don't because have to only do that. children like pictures exactly. obviously no, where did we get that I what a no dumb idea. idea but it is a thing of like the more pictures a book has the less sophisticated like it is when you're a kid and you can't read very many words you like feel so good about yourself when you finally can that you're then like pictures are for babies because now I'm (laughs) better than that I don't need pictures anymore I can just do the word thing I know the words all by myself (laughs) possibly I think that what we have here is going to be interesting just as we talk about all the different aspects of white sand 
just us coming from these two different backgrounds of someone who's read a lot of comics and then someone who has not read um, as many. But we have now volume one and volume two of White Sand available for purchase. It is the adaptation done by author Rick Hoskin of a work that was produced by Brandon but unpublished. He had many things that he was writing before he got his first publishing deal. Well over a dozen stories, I think, I've heard him talk about. And White Sand is one of those. And so Brandon has this unpublished work, just kind of sitting around. Someone approached him about doing a comic. Yeah, I think the comic company is called dynamite Mm -hmm. i believe uh yeah and they approached him and were like hey do you have any unpublished work we are really interested in adapting something that you've got and brandon was open to the idea and gave them white sand um because he felt that specifically this magic system lends itself to visual depiction that was one of the first things i remember seeing about white sand is that brandon specifically wanted it done in a comic book or thought it would work well in a comic book because of the magic system. I love Brandon's magic systems, so I obviously bought White Sand. And let's just do kind of like a smash review, almost like a just first thoughts. What'd you you see? What'd you like uh, as someone who is new to what comics could be? How did you feel about uh, White Sand? Because we had adapted by Rick Hoskin, but the artwork was done by Julius Gopez, uh, and the coloring was done by Ross Campbell, just giving everybody their Credit. exactly their For dues. Sure. It's also key parts and key ways that the medium is interpreted to list kind of those three people, because you have an artist who actually may not do much of the coloring in mm. the comic book kind of production Mm -hmm. uh and so those are kind of two roles that i feel are going to be on display in volume two about how differently you can see an artist's work and we'll talk about that a little bit later but what do you think about white sand just kind of first thoughts yeah i i have mixed feelings about it initially i was really unenthused that we were getting a cosmere book that was gonna be a comic book because like i said i'm not a big comic reader But I think it was better than I was expecting. Like, the first volume, I was like, okay, okay, okay. I get this. I can do this. I do think that I miss the depth of world building that you get in an actual book that you really don't get in a comic book because of the format. And everything has to be done through exposition or not at all. The artwork I sometimes find confusing, especially in the first book. I just felt like there wasn't enough distinction in the depictions of all the different characters, especially like the Sandmasters. Like some pages I was like, I can't tell if this is Kenton or Dryle or like, who is this? They all look the same. And that's a problem. That is a huge problem. And I think that your apprehension or kind of I like some things but then like other things is also how I feel about White Sand both volume one and volume two Um, I do think that volume two was an improvement in many ways but I have very mixed feelings about White Sand that has been shown to us so far at the same time I have a lot of hope for the possibility of more visual depictions of Brandon's work. Yeah, sure. Like, there's a lot of things that I like about it, and I think that's maybe what's so disappointing, is that I feel like there is so much potential that was just not realized. That is a great way of putting it, potential unrealized, because you mentioned the artwork, which I thought was gorgeous. I mean, I truly believe that the artwork seen in volume one and the vast majority of volume two was really, really impressive. There was an incredible amount of attention to detail. I thought that the style 
that the artist chose was very unique and kind of one of a kind where you really got a kind of gritty sense of, for me, it kind of just made the world feel a little dirty and uh, lived in, used. And then it made moments where there are bright displays of color and color differentiation so much more impactful because it starts out volume one in in the desert and it's all taking place on this like backdrop of you know think of your your tatooines or your death valleys and your mars scapes where it's just kind of like open expanse of sand all one color and then that's what i get used to over a dozen pages or so and then boom they hit you with like the greenery of the city or the visions into the dark sider camps and stuff and yeah. so you could just get a, a whole new vibe and you keep that artwork throughout the entire experience so like i really liked the pure visual experience but i'm gonna completely agree with you that a lot of it was very confusing and yeah and missed so opportunities. I think- and well, and I think that goes to what you were saying before that you have an artist and then you have a colorer. So like the color I thought was great. Exactly. Like you were saying, they had a great use of color to uh, differentiate between places as well as uh, groups of people. Yes. So that was great. But then so then I think the issue is more with the artistry rather than the coloring. If yeah. that makes sense. It, yeah, it does make sense. And this is kind of the difficulty of comics in general is you're working you know how many brains are involved in any project right you have to really have a concrete vision the more brains that are involved yeah in any type of production of anything i was gonna say that's true of all art specificity is key yes. but especially when you're getting a whole group yeah in on it like you have to be incredibly specific so at minimum we can point to you know five brains that are working on this from brandon to ricks to julius the artist to the colorer ross we just like have a bunch of brains that are in on this and there are more obviously i don't want to shortchange the team but without a clear vision and direction that can kind of go all over the place and that's a little bit what i felt like especially in volume one it was even worse is it was like okay here's a cool idea you're gonna have ken fighting off this gigantic uh sandling which is attacking him like bursting through the sand Mm -hmm. and it's like cool you you have this kind of neat concept and this unique visual to create and then you say okay artists now go create it and they create something that's like cool in its own right and maybe if you just like took it a screen grab of the comic and just like present it to someone that would be like that looks cool but then the story gets lost mm. in just kind of like those moments or the words don't necessarily line up with what's being shown visually and so i i just felt like there was a lot of missed opportunities and loss of like the potential of what this comic could be yeah and i think to the goal or like one of the reasons to turn this story into a graphic novel like we said earlier is because it lends itself to visual depiction and to me like I find the magic system and Mistborn like a little bit confusing or like hard to imagine so I'm thinking like oh that would be great if I had a visual that would kind of help me envision this magic system But I think it falls short of that. And there's a lot of places where Kenton is using sand mastery and it should help, but it just confuses me even more. Yes. And I feel like this is probably the biggest thing is that the comic was created in order to visually show sand bending. Yeah. Uh, And it fails at that, essentially. Yeah. Like, I don't think it does a good job at all. I don't understand the way that sand bending works. That sand mastery is what they call it. But come on, Avatar, Last Airbender fans. It's sand bending. That's what's going on here. The way that the sand bending works, I'm not really sure. Like the physics of it, where when you... Even though I agree, Mistborn has a very complex magic system. 
I could, and because of the repetition, start to understand it. And then by the end, Mm -hmm. I I really felt like, okay, I I have a grasp. By the end of volume one, I literally knew nothing more about sand bending than I did at the beginning. Yeah. Other than it just like, look, look cool. Which I think is fine from like a more theory, philosophical perspective, but I at least want to know what is happening physically in the world, you know? And I felt like I didn't even understand that, where there's a few points, even in volume two, I think it gets better in volume two, but it's still confusing, where Kenton's like, I'm using my sand mastery to fight this thing or person, but it's like just a picture of him surrounded by sand, and you're just like, so what actually are yes. you doing and like one of the things early on that Ken experiences and vocalizes is that he was naturally not as endowed even though it has nothing to do with the shard of endowment uh with as much magic potential as other sand acolytes uh, in, in the the diem the group that he is a part of and his father is the mastrel of Actually, Lord Mastrell, because Mastrell is another rank. So he he is literally at the very top of the DM, and he gives birth and raises this not very powerful Sandmaster who continually says, because I was not as naturally talented, I had to be more like finesse oriented. And I learned how to use the sword where everyone else just relies on their sand mastery and their little ribbons that they can create. And you are seen as cool if you can create a dozen ribbons and you're seen as weak if you can only create one ribbon. Well, I can only create one ribbon, but I learned to do all this cool stuff with it. And then I have no idea what the cool stuff he learned to do with his one ribbon. Like what is different right. about his one ribbon use to compared to anybody else i yeah. never see anything that backs up that claim which is obviously what i should be most seen and most experiencing. yeah yeah exactly so i felt like and what this series does well i think are the the other parts of the story right where like people are talking you see like different places and different people and like all of that works really well is super interesting like everything with chris is fantastic and visually stimulating as well as you know it makes sense cognitively but i feel like the whole point was the sand mastery and that is the one thing that it doesn't do well so i think that that's a good kind of first reaction to what we experience with white sand. I don't think that this is, well, I know it's not my favorite uh, work that's been brought to life by Brandon Sanderson. I don't think that currently, through volume one and volume two, this is a 100% necessary recommend. Like, I wouldn't start anybody with this. Um, even if they were like, I don't, I'm not really into it, but I love comics. I still don't yeah. think I would start them with this thing. I think the only way I recommend this is if someone is already into the Cosmere and then it's like, oh, hey, this is like the first time we see Chris and like, it's like a cool, fun Easter egg for an existing fan. Now I will say, and what I want to do next is to try to start breaking down the different aspects that we see in White Sand and maybe we can unveil the Cosmere significance because I do feel like, despite the problems that were introduced, this is still a work of Sanderson's mind, and there are Cosmere hints going yeah. on. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Left there's right. definitely good Cosmere stuff. So let's uh, let's start to talk about that more in detail, uh, and, and just kind of leave off our our criticisms of the comic portrayal and presentation and go more into the Cosmere aspect of what is seen. Yeah. So let's kind of first take a look at just the world of Taldane. And I think we've mentioned briefly before that Taldane is a tidally locked planet. So half of it is always in daytime, bright sunlight. The other half is always in sort of like a twilight, nighttime sort of thing and they call these two different sides day side and dark side and i had previously described this relationship that taldane the planet has with the sun as similar but on the grander scale of 
Earth and the Moon, because the Moon is tidally locked with the Earth. But there's another key aspect to remember about this system and how kind of the physics and the different life forms work on both sides of Taldane is that there is actually another star in the Taldane system. This is a binary star system. The dwarf star is orbiting around the large center star, and Taldane is in between those two stars. It's quite interesting and if you don't mind, I would love to go to a quote from Chris uh, that explains both of these uh, different things. Would you mind reading this quote from uh, Chris? Sure. Quote, Taldane is a tidally locked planet trapped between the gravitational forces of two stars in a binary system. The small star is a weak white dwarf that enveloped in a particulate ring is barely visible from the dark side of the planet, end quote. And on day side, they're exposed to the blue-white supergiant. I feel like this is a super, super unique system that we haven't seen anywhere else in the Cosmere. Uh, I'm pretty sure we've only ever been exposed to single sun, Mm -hmm. like like our type of solar systems. Uh, But the way it works out the different kind of cultures and the way that the i i find fascinating and i'm really interested to like keep exploring mm-hmm. i want to know what's going on on tall dane so yeah, the how do the cultures itself... kind of develop around this unique physical division between day side and dark side yeah it definitely has some really interesting cultural things happening on the world uh day side you see because the conditions are like so severe, they live under just this blazing eye of the sun all the time. So I feel like their world is a little bit more primal. It's a little bit more based on like survival instincts, um, more, it seems more tribal. We haven't seen a lot of dark side, so hard to say, but we do know that dark side is more developed they have more technology um everyone that we've seen from dark side is a scholar which makes me think like it's dark outside all the time so people just like sit and study yeah whereas on day side they're like out you know looking for food and water and fighting and like there's a lot of action and one of the things that again we haven't seen a lot of dark side culture to really be able to say this definitively but what i really noticed on day side they're very religious and they have lots of different religions that are kind of competing or vying for power uh and i wonder if that was a specific tie because you said kind of tribal and Mm -hmm. active is the way you described it i wonder if uh that was also a component that brandon was specifically like you have these different tribes and these different kind of uh communities that have developed in the cities blah 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 and you also have these different religions that they all kind of follow. Some are very, very devout to worshiping the sun, as you can imagine. Uh, and basically all the religions like the sun, but they have like different interpretations. And there's the sand masters doing their own thing out with the, the weird sand that we're going to talk about <laughs> when it comes to the investiture. I do want to talk about some of the specific locations and like groups within those places because this is another thing that I found super confusing in a comic book setting where they're just throwing out names of people and places and not explaining them and I was just like I have no idea where we are or who these people are or why we're fighting and I mean just imagine this as an option that would be possible to do in a comic book where it's not necessarily feasible in a book you could constantly be bringing up the map of the the geography and the territory and like where people are coming from and you could make it more like in this book you have a lot of different groups we'll go over them in just a second but they're all vying for power and they have like their own little kingdom down here and their own little region you could bring up the map and like show the attack is coming from this direction get kind of yeah, tactical about it yeah or even like if they interspersed some of the chapters with like almost like a dictionary page sure. and showed like 
photo of X person with like brief little description and they could make it, you know, visually interesting. And like with a book like this, you have so much license and so much freedom to do different things that you don't in a traditional book. And use the medium that yeah, you have. Yeah, exactly. Like use the medium to its fullest extent. But anyway, enough criticism <laughs> on that. Um, okay, so on day side, we have La Sand, which is the country or the region in which the Sandmaster's Diem is located. And it's sort of in the middle of complete nothing and civilization for Dayside. So it's in between what they call the deep sand, which is the totally uninhabited desert. Like, if you go there, you'll die. And then on the other side, they have Kurzta. Kurzta. Yeah. Jeez, that's hard to say. Kurzta. <laughs> which uh, is just like another region that is populated and inhabited. Um, and La Sand is ruled by the Taisha Council, which is a group of sort of the lead uh, people of all of the guilds. So, yes. Yeah. You have kind of the the different specialties, the merchants, the mm-hmm. uh, Lord Admiral, uh, mm-hmm. and the... Lord General. Exactly. Lord Beggar. All of these are represented on the council uh, that makes up the 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 full Taisha. One of the members of that council is the Lord Mastrell, leader of the Diem, uh, who relatively quickly after the attack on his people, Kenton, our main character, becomes the Lord Mastrell of the Diem. Halfway or so between after volume one. Yep. And then the capital of Los And is Kazare. And within Kazare, there's also a Darksider enclave, which we see. Yeah, and I thought that was a pretty cool idea of like, you know, in San Francisco or New York, you have kind of a a little Italy or Chinatown. And in this capital city, you have a Darksider town of Lanzare. And that's where uh, Chris can often be seen interacting with people. Yeah, and we with that we find out something interesting, which is that on Dark Side, the sort of mythology or the story is that no no Dark Sider goes to Dayside. So Chris is like shocked to see that there's an entire enclave of her people living over here that she had no idea about. She thought was like impossible, not done. Yeah. Just uh, and having their own little community and mm-hmm. economy, and they're living their lives being just fine. Yeah, uh, they're the even world is coming expanding. up with the pigeon language between yes, the two. The, yeah, and the world is expanding very, very rapidly for Chris, who we have always known as the almost so smart. Yeah, godlike. Like, oh my god, there's something Chris doesn't know. <laughs> it's so simple because she's very young at this point. I know. <laughs> um, and okay, so then let's go to. Kurtza, the country on the other side of Los And this is where we get a lot of the conflict. Kurtza is controlled by a high priest called the Akar. So there is a, a king who is now part of the merchant class or merchant guild. Um, however, typically the king is sort of controlled by the Akar and we are seeing in current Taldane the Akar is gaining more and more and more power and the Kurtians, Christians yeah they often in the past and now war against Los And for religious reasons and that is the primary antagonist that we see uh in terms of the fighting between Kenton and the Kurzatan assassins that are uh, sent to kill him at various points throughout the uh, comic. And this is one of the things that is like creating action, but a lot of the times it's some of that kind of like scattered action or action that on the page that doesn't line up with the words mm-hmm. uh, that we talked about earlier. But they're, yes, they are primarily motivated by their religious differences and kind of how the economy has probably taken the lead and maybe more industry and development has taken the lead. 
seen religious power wane and then now religion is kind of on a a ascent back up yeah absolutely and their religion calls the sun the manifestation of the sand lord which is as kenton says quote the source of man's autonomy and independence end quote and this is why they think that sand mastery is heresy and then they sort of vow to destroy all sand masters but we also get an interesting word in that quote what is that interesting word? Oh, come on, man. Autonomy. Autonomy it is. Man's autonomy and independence. Interesting, of course, because autonomy is the shard of Tal Dane. Yep. And there is uh, some stuff that I really want to talk about when it comes to autonomy. Should we jump into it right now or save it for later? Whatever you think is best. Here's what I want to do. I want to get through uh, talking about dark side. Okay. And then we, so we can see the kind of comparison. Yeah. Right next to each other. Good point. Good point. Okay. So on dark side, obviously we see less of dark side, but what we do know again is that they are more technologically, scientifically advanced. They have guns, um, and they speak a language called dynastic. Which is probably referencing the dynasty that Chris is a part of. Hey, there you go. (laughs) Chris is a princess? Is that her? She is a duchess. A duchess, that's Mm -hmm. right. Uh, So she is a duchess of a dynasty that I am guessing in dark side past uh, came to power and used their own language and took over everything. Most likely. Most likely. (laughs) That's generally how you get languages named after you is you just have to take over everything <laughs> so chris is from ellis a country on dark side she was uh engaged to the prince of ellis gevelden uh which is the whole reason that has brought her to day side um i also want to mention a characteristic of the dark siders which this is another point where I feel like I should have known this just from reading the comic, but, but did not. I did not. And it would have been a great thing to depict in a visual medium. Um, but Darksiders, because of the light that they do get sort of filtered to their planet, it's mostly UV light, which affects how all life grows on that side of the planet. And this has caused Darksiders to have illuminated teeth, eyes, and nails. Which, again is something that you should recognize through a comic very, very quickly. Yeah, like that would be so cool Anytime to Anytime they're depicted. in a dark place, which is often yeah. for Chris, because they go to the enclave yeah. that's all dark, everyone's teeth and eyes and nails should all be bright and Glowing. illuminated. And I don't remember any scene that really showed that off. Yeah, I agree. And so we have a... Not it's, It has nothing to do with magic. It's, it's right. said to be only be about the physics of mm-hmm. uh, of living in a place that's primarily kept alive by UV light. Yeah. It also is why Darksiders uh, have dark skin despite not living in a traditional climate for a high melanin content. Right. So this I thought was interesting too. Like when I first started reading yes. White Sand, it was like, wait, how come the people who are in the sun are all the time have paler skin than the people who live in the dark. That doesn't make any sense. But it's UV because light. of... Yeah, exactly. It's very cool. I, I mean... It is cool. I think that one of the unique things about the Cosmere in general is that for me it's not easy to give a earthbound nationality or ethnicity to any of the groups in the Cosmere. I find that a good example of Brandon's skill as an author is that he's not like making a carbon copy of, say, like the Amazonians. Uh, like, these are tribal people who live in a rainforest. And I was like, okay, so they're Amazons. Uh, or, you know, just whatever, pick a, a group, a nationality, ethnicity. It's not like he's just transplanting uh w- people from earth into the cosmere he's creating something unique absolutely and he draws on things from our world obviously but he puts them together in a way that like stretches my brain i feel like in a really good healthy way okay so i found the magic and the cosmere knowledge gained from white sand to be very important 
despite not loving the comic as a whole, I think that some of the stuff that we pick up is really worth mentioning and worth talking about. Most of the quotes I'm going to be throwing at you are going to be coming from the Arcanum Unbounded, uh, which has a Taldane section, and if you only have that right now, it does actually have a black and white copy of, I believe, the first chapter or two of Mm -hmm. White Sand Volume 1, so you can get an idea of uh, the comic before actually buying, if you already own Arcanum Unbounded. So what I think is most interesting about the planet of Taldane, and this is what you had mentioned earlier, that Chris, in the Arcanum Unbounded, said this about investiture on her planet. Quote, for years, we assumed that our shard autonomy had invested only on dayside through the sunlight itself. We know now it is not as simple as this, though the mechanism is best explained under those assumptions. The investiture beats down from the sky, is absorbed by a microflora that grows like a lichen on the surfaces of the sand, giving it its brilliant white color when fully invested, or deep blackness when investiture is depleted, end quote. That is a great description. And it is a very unique way of investiture manifesting itself on the planet. Mm-hmm. We've had the planet uh, where it, that is home to devotion and dominion, where we have talked about how the planet itself is being, come, mm. being invested. Yeah, cell. And we have seen an island, Pat G, mm-hmm. become invested mm-hmm. and possibly even sentient in some ways. But here, it's like the sun is the source of investiture, which, of course, makes a lot of sense. It's a, it's a natural uh, kind of thing. There's a bunch of other stuff. The microflora that grows like a lichen on the surface of the sand is brilliant and white when invested but then can be drained by the sand masters by using uh their sand mastery yeah so i guess the sand itself is not exactly. invested right this is the important it's just part. the microflora yes okay so i'm gonna go it's gonna get real nerdy <laughs> in here there's a page in chapter five of volume two that has chris showing cinder some science experiments and she is discovering this inside of white sand for the first time and then arcanum unbounded she has like the full knowledge of it so in white sand we get the very beginnings of something that is like stated baby chris exactly stated (laughs) as a full functional theory by Arcanum Unbounded Chris and we don't quite have the middle but this is what I'm kind of guessing and I'm going to put the pieces together and hopefully they're they're correct for you okay but the sand is actually coated in a what what she says is a kind of film very thin but very very resilient And I believe it is this film that is actually the storage of investiture Mm -hmm. and not the sand itself. Mm -hmm. Because this quote comes from the Arcanum Unbounded. Chris says, quote, Certain people can control this reaction using the water from their own bodies to forge a brief cognitive bond They can draw investiture in very small amounts directly from the spiritual realm and use that to control the sand, end quote. I feel like this magic system is very convoluted. It has way more going on. Why are there so many steps? (laughs) Well, I think it has so many steps because of the the autonomy, the, the shard itself. I feel like what is going on... And it started with that quote that you said, the kind of philosophy, the uh-huh. religion of the Kirstians. Uh-huh. They call the sun the manifestation of the sand lord, the source of man's autonomy and independence. 
Oh, so you think the sun is the shard? Yes, exactly. Ooh, that's and interesting. it's also remarked in Arcanum Unbounded that the magic system of sand mastery actually requires very little energy compared to the other types of investiture mm. use. Because they're going straight to the spiritual realm, yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think that they're what they're doing is they're not Okay, so it's not as simple as saying the sun shines on this like lichen film that is on the sand and then that is invested and then the sand masters come around, they use that investiture until it's all gone. Right. So it's not as simple as that. Right. They're creating a cognitive bond through water with themselves and the lichen that is on the sand and then pulling directly from the spiritual realm because I think the sun is autonomy, or at least a manifestation of autonomy, and that is like making them the most efficient users of investiture in the Cosmere that we've seen so far. I think this is important. But, I mean, it's still grounded in the sense that you can only perform sand mastery as long as your body has water in it. Yes, you are limited by water. And it's one yeah. of the most uh, important aspects of sand mastery is that the, like they, they literally just call it becoming dehydrated or overextended mm -hmm. uh, is the term when they use too much uh, water or they use too much sand mastery. So there is a hard limit based on water in your body. But what have we seen in all the different cosmere planets when it comes to technology using investiture right finding a loophole right yeah like, like if they can collect the lichen yes and somehow uh and like provide it with water in yeah. some way well yeah. you, and you can conceivably because this is getting super nerdy but it's in the text like this is this has happened in the book chris is doing a science experiment and she's demonstrating that the the sand from day side, when it's invested, is all white. And when it has no invested, it is black, dark. But when sand is eaten by a sandling and then excreted out, it's coated with this film. And this film, which can then store the investiture and like renew itself over and over again, it's all cooperating with the environment and the ecosystem. So like the sandlings are necessary to produce the lichen film that grows on the sand right. and then, then can be manipulated. I feel like this is a magic system that is ripe for manipulation. You have just, I feel like the oh, potential. Oh, like if you introduce more sandlings, you get more invested sand? Sure. Or if you can control the process that a sandling does internally where they basically coat this invested, not even invested film. It's just like this lichen that can then absorb investiture and hold the investiture. If you can create that, then you have a, you can do anything. You could put the lichen on just like a sheet of paper and that will have investiture. It doesn't just have to be sand. I'm thinking that this is like why Chris's experiments were shown and also why autonomy is so set on keeping Taldane isolated because this is one of the things we know about autonomy is that he is forcefully keeping Taldane closed off from the rest of the Cosmere. You think that that's because autonomy doesn't want the technology to get out? I'm not 100% certain but I do think that what we have seen elsewhere in the Cosmere is types of investiture and types of like magic being passed around and sold and there's the cosmic economy that I always talk about. Autonomy, probably because of the intent of the shard, doesn't want any of that going on. I just, I feel like all the other energy sources and the sources of investiture, Storm, on Rashar, so on and so forth, I feel like they're not as good as the sun because the sun, it like... 
impacts the entire planet, the entire life. Everything is then built around this like process of natural investiture. It's in everybody. You can tap in just as a day sider and possibly as a dark sider too. Well, you can tap into the spiritual realm directly, even if it's just a little bit. That's not something that necessarily maybe. everyone else can do as easily. I feel like there's a pot. And why is Chris so old? What is she doing? Is she casually <laughs> absorbing investiture because that's just like a thing that tall Dane people can do Maybe. to stay alive yeah. I don't know but like weird stuff is going on with Chris to keep her alive for so long or time dilation something's right. something's going on there I just feel like there's something really important about the sun as a source of investiture and then like impacting everything else does that make sense yeah do you think you could read uh the chris quote from the arcanum unbounded when she talks about autonomy's policy yeah quote autonomy's policy of isolationism in recent times in direct contrast to her interference with other planets i might add has prevented travel to and from taldane for many many years a fact of which i am all too aware end quote so Autonomy has a policy of isolationism for her own planet. I thought that was yep. interesting yeah. that autonomy is noted as a female. I'm not 100% certain if that is still correct. I Right. So, yeah. Then we got some the things question. going on. Yeah. Because we, everyone thought that autonomy was Trell. Yes. And then we'll talk about what happens at the end of volume two, but... Well, yeah, but I'm just saying yes, Trell, I, from all of our understanding, is a male. Yes. However, autonomy was or is held by Bavadin. Yes. Who, who is apparently a female. And there is like no other remark about sexuality uh, or gender uh, when it comes to Bavadin other than this one line from Chris in the Arcanum Unbounded. Mm -hmm. So we don't know. That could have just been her saying, like, all shards, the shards themselves, she, like, gives the title of her, and she's maybe sure. not talking like about... Like a ship? Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, because there is... The shard is more like a ship, a vessel. Right, right, right. Uh, uh, so we have a question here about, are some of our theories about Trell inaccurate and before we get to trell in volume two let's talk about just some of the other characters pretty quickly um i i just kind of want to introduce the people that we see uh in white sand could you start us off sure yeah so obviously we have our protagonist kenton you talked a little bit about him before so he's recently sort of taken up the mantle of lord Mastral, a title he never thought he would get passed down from his father so he finds himself in this position uh and he has some friends along the way to help him out yes Deeran is one of his oldest friends trained with him as an acolyte in the diem and now is kind of his right hand man uh he is one of the characters that is actually easier to spot because he has red hair mm -hmm. which makes him stand out yeah again in a comic book it should be super easy to differentiate between characters, but like you said, the Sandmasters all blend in together. Yeah. And then we also have Kenton's best friend, Eric, who is also very distinctive. They do a great job with Eric's character. Um, and he is the son of the Lord General. He's sort of a rogue and a renegade and yes. has chosen not to follow in his father's footsteps and go into the military. Presumably this is why his father disowned him and they're, they've they been estranged for a while. Um, and Eric has become a merchant and he ventured to a different country. I want to say it might have been uh Kirsten. Kirsta, yeah, but I'm not 100% sure. But he has recently come back and sort of allied himself with Kenton once again. Now, I'm not going to pretend like I can pronounce his name. Double A R I K. Arik. Yeah, Arik. I don't know. So, Arik to me has the best page in the entire comic. This is actually towards the end of volume two. A bunch of weird things happen at the end of volume two. One of them, in my opinion, 
is that the story gets a lot more direct and directed, in my opinion. Uh, it, it seems like someone with like a real clear vision finally started saying, like, this is exactly what is going to be produced. And I feel like it was a huge benefit because on this page with Arik, and I did think about uh, taking pictures of the comic so that you could follow along as a listener, uh, but I think Brooke and I both decided that that would be a little bit too much like uh, stealing or freebooting uh, from the the artists and the, the production team. So we don't want to actually take pictures of what I'm talking about. Sorry, but the page that I'm referencing is very unique in its layout. It has three vertical panels on each page and then you're you're seeing it spread left to right so you have one two three on the left one two three on the right and they are mirrored on both of the pages so on the farthest left you has have a shot of kenton seated and he is facing the right and then on the very far right you have a shot of kenton seated and he is facing the left and then each internal uh panel is mimicked with both the visuals and the experience that's going on with the character this is the greatest comic book page in the entire series this is what a comic is supposed to be able to do Uh, yeah i agree it's very striking the visual elements tell the story just as much as the words do and like you can just sit and look at it and like it looks nice (laughs) and that is the power of comics like this page in my opinion they hit out of the park yeah and it is honestly a wonder it is just our story and it's weird there's something going on on this page Mm -hmm. that i am not 100 percent certain yeah what is happening because me too from my opinion and this is just my read you can tell me if you disagree and anyone out there obviously hit us up on at Cosmere Combo Twitter and Reddit and Facebook. Let us know what you think about this page. I got the vibe that Arik was having a Gollum and Smeagol moment. That he is having a almost split personality conversation literally in a mirror with himself and is like arguing with himself in like two different kind of vibes the same way yeah, I mean, I don't know if I would go as far to compare it to Gollum and Smeagol because I don't think he's had like a psychotic break. Um, I think he's doing a normal thing that we all do, which is talk to ourselves, especially when we're trying to make an important decision or like when we're trying to convince ourselves of something, right? We like talk to each other or talk to ourselves in the third person and say like, no, you need to do this right now or and second it especially, person. It especially works out with the artist's choice as well, that he's kind of talking to himself in a mirror and the pages are mirrored. So like, right. I totally agree that that might have just been the way that they chose to show and kind of visually match everything up. Just remember, we've had other people in the Cosmere who talk to themselves, but they're not talking to themselves. They're talking to a shard that has some influence in them. And so whether it's a kind of Vin Mm -hmm. communicating with Ruin uh, or some type of, I I honestly don't know because I, I, we haven't necessarily explored how autonomy's power manifests itself fully on this planet, but like I just found, I found the page beautiful and I found the content very interesting. Yeah, but I think that's like not even the most interesting thing about the content. I think the most interesting thing is that he starts bringing up his past with Kenton. Yes. And... What does it sound like? I mean, maybe this was intentional, but I just felt like they all of a sudden started referencing something that I had no reference for, and then there was like no information. And I was kind of like totally lost but he is kind of, like they've been friends this whole time and like have gotten along like everything's cool but then in this page he's kind of saying that like kenton used to be like a bad person or did something bad to him so he should leave before he gets hurt but like and then he shows kenton giving him a gift but like the gift was 
evil or something. I don't know. I just, I found it all very confusing. Well, see, I didn't find the reference of like evil or bad. Uh, I just felt it as kind of a, like, again, okay, so I, one, thought that Eric might be having a psychotic break, mental uh, split type of thing. I also got the vibe from this page that Ark and Kent, or Ark may have had some more feelings for Kenton than Kenton had for him. This is not 100% on the page. I'm kind of reading between the lines, but quoted directly, Ark says, quote, all these years and Kenton still thinks your father drove you away. He doesn't have any clue. Don't kid yourself that he's changed when he hasn't. He cares nothing for others. All he cares about is his fight and his success. End quote. Yeah, definitely. Which I feel like is so at odds with everything we've seen from Kenton. Like, yeah, when we first see him, he's kind of rebellious and headstrong. But I don't think we've ever seen Kenton fit that description of like being really self-centered and like only concerned about himself. Like the whole time he's been trying to save the Diem. Yeah, they did try to uh, kind of make this more clear at one point when, like, Kenton is, like, owning up to Chris about how he was in the past when they first met uh, and how he's kind of changed now. But I think this is more, like, again, a, a lack of showing in the early pages, in the early part of Volume 1, the backstory that they wanted to have so that they could do this now. Mm you know, they're kind of retconning a little bit uh, where it's like, you didn't necessarily show this, but you're now trying to tell us that this is what we saw in the past. Yeah, it just seems like it doesn't line up. And that's why, like, my... Okay, so I don't know why I went so deep with this, but I literally thought that there was kind of like a scorned lover thing going on here. Yeah, I was actually thinking that too. That's the vibe that I got is that, okay, so... You just said you didn't see on the page Kenton as like this super self-centered person. And I'm going to agree I didn't see that either. It could have either A, been that they meant to show that and they did a bad job of it. Or B, they did not mean to show that because that is not who Kenton was, but it's the interpretation that Arik has. Why would he have that interpretation? Maybe because he's a scorned lover. Maybe because he wanted a little bit more from the friendship mm-hmm. with Kenton than he got. And he kind of manifested that in his own mind as Kenton super selfish. Kenton never looks um, to anyone else out of his own success. He's just trying to look out for Kenton and never thinks about me. Well, uh, and combined with him saying Kenton still thinks that I went away because of my dad. Yes. But like yeah. he doesn't know the truth. And that I also found confusing because I was like, wait, so did Kenton like do something to him? Like what? Well, but it makes more sense if you think of it as like, oh, if Eric was like in love with him and didn't yes. think that there was any chance in, you know, anything happening and was just like, okay, I just need to get away from this. Yes. That makes a lot more sense. And this is in the last uh, 10, 20 pages, maybe of volume two. So I'm excited to see where this goes uh, and how this develops. It literally could be a wonder, but I hope that they explore this more because I found this page worth volume one and volume two yeah i was like this is enough to like keep me interested and keep me engaged especially if they do more stuff like this yeah it would be interesting either a to have i believe the first well we've had a couple of characters who were um side characters who were like interested in women some lesbian characters right uh yeah uh, Lessie? Or, no, not Lessie. Um, but uh, Mistborn Era 2, you're thinking about uh, yeah. R- Renette? R- yeah, yeah, Renette. Uh, who <laughs> Wayne is very much attracted to, but she is not attracted yeah. to men. <laughs> uh, so we've seen that play out, but I don't believe we've seen a male character uh, who is homosexual uh, in any of the portrayals. So that would be like a first in the Cosmere. But again, I don't know if that's what they were going for. For sure. Yeah. Because then also, like, at the end of this page, he says, 
he compares Kenton and his father and says, oh, if you stay too long, you'll be just like them, making decisions that determine whether men live or die. So then it seems like that is his beef. So there's just like, there's so much information on this page, which is fantastic because you go basically the whole story and you're just like, can I please get some more information? And there finally is, but then I feel like there's so much information and you're just like, wait, this doesn't make sense. And there's too much, too many different things in the same place. What I'm hoping is that the pieces eventually get put down and this puzzle of a page gets unraveled. Do we want to uh, briefly mention the people who are hanging out with Chris? Uh, yes. Because, go ahead, we, we've seen these people in other places in the Cosmere, but this is the first time that they've in, been introduced. Yeah, so the people, well, Chris has a few people traveling with her. We have Bound, who is a soldier and Chris's kind of bodyguard. He is the one that we know as Blunt, from the Pure Lake interlude with Ishik. And at the end of volume two, there is this growing conspiracy that becomes kind of confirmed Mm -hmm. that uh, the backstory of, how'd you say it? Baun? Yeah, I don't know. I think I always say Bayon is what I said in my head. Uh, But he came to Chris after like, Some people died in a mysterious circumstance, uh, and Chris kind of took his word that the people died by enemy hands, and now it kind of looks like Bayon may have uh, sabotaged or betrayed uh, his friends. So that is literally like one of the last pages of volume two. Yeah, well, and doesn't he say something about like trying to kill Chris? Yes, yes, he, he... is alluding and they set it up on the page in, t- in terms of the visuals. And then they get interrupted, yes, right? Yes, as yeah. like one of them is going to go for the gun and then the other person uh, that Chris travels with, Cinder, arrives to kind of interrupt them and then Bayon just kind of plays it off and like bows and walks out. Mm-hmm. And so like that's one of the last things that we leave Chris with is like, yeah. is Bayon an assassin? But yeah. then we've seen him later. Right. And so he's part of the on. 17th Shard. Yeah. So I feel like they got to work it out eventually. Yeah, but for sure. But something has been introduced yeah. uh, to kind of play it up. Now that we're super nerdy and we know that Bayon is in other places in the Cosmere, but on the page, it does just kind of read as kind of like interesting intrigue. For sure. And then Cinder, as you mentioned, he is traveling with Chris. He is a professor and a linguist, and she's traveling with a couple other scholars as well. So that is kind of the thing that really gives the impression that uh, Dark Side is a lot more uh, academically yes. inclined. And then we have one other character who really took off. She was introduced in Volume 1, but really came into her own uh, in Volume 2, and how are you going to say her name? I've been saying it Ice. A-I-S. Ice. She is a kind of policeman or investigator, uh, detective, yeah, they're slash called bodyguard. Tracked. Yes. And the Tracked are, they kind of seem like super advanced special forces police. Yeah. Uh, they like have normal police tasks, you know, track down these criminals, but they're like the best of the best. Sure, totally. And she's at the top of her game, and she is tracking down a crime lord. Yeah, so her prime objective is to find Sherazan, who is sort of a mob boss in the area. That's like her mission is to find Sherazan. She is currently suspecting that Nilto, the Lord Beggar, is Sherazan. But she has been assigned by the Taisha Mm -hmm. council to guard Kenton. She is a Kirstian. Kirstian. Yes. She is a Kirstian (laughs) who believes that the Sandmasters are heretics and blasphemous and against her God and against her religion. And And she is need to be taken out. Yes. Yes. And her people are trying to assassinate uh, Kenton, yeah. and she is tasked with guarding him. And she does it very well. She's a competent guard. Uh, and I think guard. this is one of the most 
interesting and complex characters that we see in the entire Cosmere, I think. Um, She unravels like an onion. As a female character, I just, I find her fantastic. It's really, really wonderful because she has these ideals that she is 100% dedicated to, right? First of all, her profession as a tract, she takes very, very seriously. Like she is a dedicated uh, career woman. And then her religion, she's also extremely devout. And she finds herself in this interesting position of having those two things that are so important to her compete. And that's a really interesting struggle to see a character go through. And then on top of that, she also gets the dimension of being a very loving and soft and tender wife and mother. Yes. And And like all of... Okay, so that was the first conflict that you see. A woman torn between her profession and her religion. And that's a personal struggle of just like internally got this shit going on. I got to pretend Kenton. I hate him for religious reasons. But then it becomes so much more complex when her family is introduced and she has her husband who's like worried about the increasing number of assassins and the internal battle that his wife and she's like you're in danger they're coming after everyone you need to go into hiding and take our kids and like so she has this whole other thing going on and i i really liked the portrayal as well as the um just internal external conflicts and how everything was kind of connected and shown really yeah well she is with her so character. incredibly complex and interesting and i think that is one of the absolute strongest points of these books is her character i would definitely agree eric got the best page and visualization <laughs> yeah but ice is the most unique and complex character yeah There's only one other thing that I want to mention in real detail, and I found so many things interesting about this. At the end of Volume 2, the very last chapter, we have something that is very jarring, in my opinion. A 100% change in the artist for all the panels in the last chapter. It is a significant shift from something that is very gritty and busy where every single panel has detailed backgrounds and you can even see like scribbles on the wall and uh you know just pages with marks on them to a very very what i would call cartoonish vibe yes yeah it really reminds you of a cartoon it's like very simplistic and clean yes. and simple. Yes. The colors are brighter. Uh, the characters' faces are shown in a lot more detail and close-ups. Uh, and the overall artwork feels like it has been stripped down and kind of reimagined in what I honestly thought was like, oh, this looks like Avatar Season 3 or like Legend of Korra. Yeah, definitely. And at first, honestly, like, at first, my first thought was just like, why does Chris all of a sudden look so different? Do we just not know how to write people of color? Like, it was bad. Yeah. I was like, why is there no consistency in her character? Like, this is so offensive. (laughs) Well, she went from a woman and she like bounces back and forth. This I did not like this either. But like, she went from a woman who has dreadlocks. Like yes. Crazy dreadlocks. Yeah. Long dreadlocks. And they're dreadlocks. like gorgeous and fantastic. Yes. And the first time she showed up in the books, I was just like, yes, queen. Like, you're amazing. <laughs> and she rocks it. And she's got these like fantastic and outfits with the hat yeah. and the colors and yeah. like the white on her black skin. So it's all gorgeous. The like style of her outfits, her like physical presence yes. and the way that she's depicted she owns moving. It. Yeah. It like her action in the first book and the first part of book volume two, yeah. two is like so distinctive and her it's Chris. movement yeah gives you such an idea of who she is and then she shows up in this last part like completely different and i was just like who are you where is chris why are you different it literally looks like she's a tan brunette woman <laughs> uh with kind of like straight flowing hair 
I mean, almost like a, there's a, a shot at the very beginning of chapter six where they're standing and they look like Anakin and Padme. Uh, yeah. and, I mean, it's just like, she, she looks like a, a brunette woman with yeah, a completely and like, different like backstory. The style of her yeah. outfit is different. There's like one shot where she looks much more sexualized and like voluptuous. But and then you see a back shot and like her shoulders and her arms are all like muscular, which I felt like was appropriate. But there was just this like whiplash of like, who is this? And so the artwork is jarring. And I also have discovered through the Reddit, uh, coming from Peter, who is Brandon Sanderson's assistant, he has said that the artist for Chapter 6 will also not be the artist for Volume 3. Something happened. I have no idea. I have some guesses. Uh, But I have no idea what happened. The original artist was not able to complete the book as they wanted for whatever reason and they got this new artist to literally do one chapter and he will not be back for volume three and i just found this jarring as a reader i don't hate the artwork and i think that if it had been done the entire time of book two i might have actually said this was an improvement. You know, I this was a I would love to see a marriage of the two, honestly. I would. I would. Because I think the simplicity of this last chapter helped me understand yes. what was happening. Yes. Because it was a little bit more clean, simple. It was a lot clearer in you the want action. The in between. Yeah, but I did like what you said, that gritty feel of the original artwork. So if you can kind of put those together, yes. that's like where you want to live. Sweet spot. Absolutely. They basically kind of set up a, what I thought was like very unique artistic style. There are problems with it, but then this new style for chapter six is like the lowest common denominator type of stuff. Mm -hmm. It it is very simplistic and straightforward and it looks like- Yeah, it's almost like they ran out of time. Yeah, like, like they were like, this we just really task. need you to like do this now. Yeah, like <laughs> yeah. forget all the detail, just write it. Let's put it in the book and print it. And I don't know what was going on with that, but what we get in this last chapter in terms of story is Kenton, who is going to save a group of workers who are trapped in a collapsing building. And he's going to use some sand mastery, and it looks cool, uh, not necessarily showing us a whole bunch of what's going on with sand mastery but but it's at least like well-defined ribbons of sand that i can see rather than just like (laughs) explosion of color uh i agree there there are some clear benefits in the the design choice of the last chapter but kenton saves these people and like the leader or the foreman of these workers comes up to thank him and kenton's like hey man What's your name? And the guy says, what, Brooke? Trell. Trell it is. Trell, Ah! Trell, Trell. Trell makes an appearance. He's a bald-headed daysider, so he's a pale skin or light skin, and is the leader of these group of workers. Seems just kind of like a normal dude doing his normal job, uh, who then is saved by Kenton and is asked to spread the message that the Sandmasters are back to help the people, but he's Trell. Trell has made many other appearances in the Cosmere. We all know this. We're not going to go over them all right now. Yeah. But Trell's everywhere. Trell's on Skadriel. Trell's been mentioned in the Arcanum Unbounded. Yeah, and Trell has been suspected to be the holder of autonomy, which obviously... Can't happen. I mean, I think, at least anyway, when we see him in this book, he is not the holder of autonomy. So this introduces a whole bunch of interesting possibilities in my mind. Yeah. So what I'm thinking is Bavadin is a female. Okay. Held autonomy. Yes. Is holding autonomy at the time of this book. Yes. At some point in the future from White Sand Volume 2, Trell somehow takes over yes and assumes the shard of autonomy i think that is a possibility and would then maybe explain uh why the presence that is seen as like the red cloud around scadriel and the corruption of metals on scadriel in mistborn air 2 
uh, is so associated with the name Trell because he becomes a shard holder and then starts to mess with other systems. However, I have a secondary theory, and it's a little bit crazier. Okay. We know that Bavadin was the original holder of the shard autonomy. We can assume that Trell cannot be Bavadin uh, because, you know, the planet exists and Trell looks like this normal dude. <laughs> so how about your theory is a good one, and I think it's a total possibility, but here's my theory. Trell, as well as Kenton and the team that we have built up in White Sand, is going to become more important, but he hasn't become important yet. He's also not going to become autonomy. Here's where my theory goes way different. We also know in the Cosmere, the planet of Threnody was once home of the shard of... Ambition. And Ambition was fighting with Odium in the past. Lost around Threnody. The planet of Threnody, she got like beaten up, or he got beaten up. They got beaten up. We don't know if they died, but we don't know what happened to them after the loss at Threnody. Here's my theory. Odium was able to either kill or take the Shard of Ambition and then use that as a bargaining chip to form an alliance with someone who would never form an alliance based on their intent, which is autonomy. Autonomy, all about doing things yourself, you know, pulling yourself up by the bootstraps. Not big on alliances, but we kind of assume that autonomy and Odium are working together. Yeah. So I think that Odium was like, hey, autonomy, you looking good, Bavadin? Uh -huh. You want to partner up with me? And Bavadin is all like, no. And he's like, what if I give you another shard? And he gives maybe a splinter, maybe the whole thing, but he gives ambition mm. to autonomy. And then throughout a series of events that we do not know, Trell becomes like a champion of autonomy and she gifts him and makes him ambition. And so what you have is Trell with ambition partnered with autonomy who's allied with odium okay okay that's like my it. crazy theory I right like now it. yeah it's a little crazy but i like it is just kind of connecting pieces that are up in the air right now yeah so it's not uh written and that's complete speculation and people shoot it down if you can on the twitter <laughs> at cosmere convo reddit on Facebook, we're everywhere. We love it. We love you guys. Thank you so much. We're passing huge milestones in terms of number of downloads. So much appreciation. So much love. It's so much fun for us. It's a little bit of work, but it's so much fun <laughs> to do the work and we just nerd out. Yeah, it's mostly fun. <laughs> oh, it's definitely mostly fun. <laughs> and we really appreciate all the feedback that we have gotten. I know people are super interested in more Cosmere conversations, but we're out of books. We have done all the books, Brooke. I know, we really have. And there's nothing on the horizon for a oh my while. Gosh, so sad. So we are open for suggestions, but I think what we are going to call this episode 20 is the end of season one Aww. of Cosmere Conversations. 20 episodes, a great start, or instead of rereading everything, maybe just turn on like one episode at any time you ever want and just be like, oh, cool, now I can learn a little bit about White Sand. Or, you know, let's, uh, before reading Stormlight Archive 4, I want to go back <laughs> and listen to all of our Oathbringer breakdowns. Ooh, yeah. Like that. That will be a clutch when the next Stormlight comes out. Exactly. And so we hope that you spread the message of Cosmere Conversation. We're definitely still going to make episodes, uh, in the future, but it is, I think, a good time to say a job well done on season one. Congrats. Thank you, everyone. Go team. Yeah, we did it. You did it. <laughs> We're all amazing. Until next time, life before death. Strength before weakness. Journey before destination. Mm -hmm.